Welcome to Moravian College and tonight's celebration of President Grigsby's inauguration. Thank you everybody for being here. My name is Trevor Glanville. I'm a senior here at Moravian. Uh, I was thankfully invited by Dr. Grigsby and Deb Evans to uh, moderate tonight's event, and I was so overwhelmed and so excited about it. Um, but through great preparation, I, I couldn't be more excited to be here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Tonight, we're so excited to have the Moravian College community here um, to really get to know some of our past leadership here at the school. And I couldn't be more excited to hear some stories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have alumni representative from the 1940s all the way to our recent graduates. So that goes to speak for our real strong Moravian community here. So I couldn't be more excited to meet some of you all. Um, first, Dr. Collier. All right. So Dr. Hermione e. Collier served as Moravian College president from 1969 through 1986. So just a quick history of view of what was going on in 1969. So Richard Nixon became the president of the United States. Uh, NASA just happened to do this weird thing called landing on the moon. Um, <laughs> uh, the New York Jets won their first Super Bowl. It was a massive feat because they haven't been back since. Um, the Academy Award for Best Picture went to Oliver. I've never seen it. I'm so sorry. Um, gay rights and civil rights were being brought to the forefront of American ethics and politics. And some of Dr. Collier's students were listening to ACDC and Aerosmith on their cassette players. Um, and believe it or not, home computers were just being brought out to the public. Um, Dr. Collier served as president for this college for 17 years. And I'm so excited to hear from you. And I was very excited to meet you. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Roger Harry Martin. Uh, I think most people know him as Rusty. Mm -hmm. All right, so Rusty. He served as president from 1986 to 1970, uh, 19, 1997. We are back in history now. Uh, in 1986, the Oprah Winfrey show just first aired. Um, Ronald Reagan was the president. Uh, Pixar, animo Pixar animations opened for the first time. Um, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant explosion occurred. Uh, the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. I don't know if any of you know I'm a big football fan, so that's the only reason why you're getting this. Um, the average salary was $15,000. Students had access to their first laptops created by IBM, um, and they were watching Tom Cruise in Top Gun. So for 11 years, Moravian College was guided by Dr. Martin's leadership, and I couldn't be more excited to have him here. So thank you. Dr. Christopher Tomford. He served as president from 2006 until 2013. George W. Bush was the president of the US. Pittsburgh won the Super Bowl. The Winter Olympics were occurring in Italy. Uh, the US took home nine gold, nine silver, and seven bronze. He served as president through the capture of Osama bin Laden and Hurricane Irene and Superstore in Sandy, as well as the financial crisis of 2008. All of these events really required Dr. Tomford to have amazing damage and, manage and crisis management skills. So, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Tomford served this <laughs> You're welcome. Well, you know what? That, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm, re <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm retired now. <laughs> so for seven years, Moravian College was led by Dr. Tomford. And for three of those years, I was his student. Uh, so I couldn't be more ex excited to have you back on campus. So thank you very much, Dr. You're Tomford. Welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so first, I'm going to point to you, Dr. Collier. I am interested to know about during your time as president of Moravian College, what traditions or what uh, experiences would you like to bring back uh, and you would like to see on campus today? And the answer can't be plaid suits, bow ties, or shoulder pads. That's and the bow tie, hold on. That, that, OK, the bow <laughs> One bow tie, that's it. That's all good. we're allowing. There's a strict minimum on that. That's it. <laughs> So, Dr. Collier, what are your thoughts? Things I'd like to bring back to the campus? Yes. Wow. Seems to me you have a heap of things that at the moment are just kind of superior to things we were doing in those days. <laughs> oh, I, I want to make clear that we did not prep any of these people for these questions <laughs> at all. So they are completely on the spot. 
Well, I think a tradition that I remember about Moravia, and even as I was a member of the faculty, was really the closeness. That's a little bit of a corny word, but the closeness of associations that the makeup of the campus shared, students and faculty and the administration. And I, I would like to think, in my at least looking at symptoms, it seems to be the case, but if not, I would think that the, um, the close involvement and association and respect for and caring for one another would be something I would hope could be attenuated always. And that that would be something that would be distinctive about Moravian. I, I think the idea of our being a strong, leading, uh, on the cutting edge liberal arts college is a fine identity. It can be said about a lot of places. But the climate of the institution in which that takes place, it can be a fingerprint that's peculiar to the institution. And Moravian has had that quality about it for years. I suspect I'm repeating what is here today because it feels that way to me. But if there was anything I'd like to be assured of, is it would be that. So that that relationship and coupling with people would be not just an immediate college experience, but it would be enduring for life and be a finger mark on people as they went to another world and things they did with other people as well. A right. kind of learning to be that type of person. Right. Dr. Martin, do you have any thoughts on that? On traditions? Yes. Yes, sir. We brought in, uh, so, well, first of all, as we were talking at dinner, there were a number right. of, of wonderful traditions that existed here. Uh, can I tell you, the story of... Please uh, do. So when I came here in 1986, for instance, and apparently this doesn't go on anymore, but I thought it was a great tradition. Okay. I was up working late, and I noticed a group of uh, men crowding around Main Hall. <laughs> Fraternity brothers, right? Fraternity brothers. Oh, we have great reputation. And I didn't, you know, I didn't <laughs> take much note of this. And now it's approaching midnight. Now there are about 100 uh, men standing out in front of um, uh, Main Hall. And I'm getting a little bit worried, you know. And then at about 12.15, there must have been three or 400 of these fraternity brothers. I think they were. I don't know. And uh, all of a sudden, the women came out. They were serenaded by the men. And they dumped water on, the, uh, on these, these students. But just before that, getting really worried, I called campus security up. And I said, I think that there is a riot going to take place <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on campus. Uh, and uh, uh, could you send the, uh, 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 some officers here? And he said, uh, what is your name? <laughs> so I said, um, Rusty who? Rusty Martin. <laughs> he said, how do you spell that? <laughs> so I said, damn it, get the police. <laughs> but by the time they arrived, of course, the women had dumped the water, and all the guys had left. And the, the police arrived, and they thought it was nuts. They thought you were the crazy one. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, traditions like this, and then we, of course, when... Um, <clears throat> The Bidnigna statue was, was put up for our 250th anniversary. We made up stuff. I think Martha Reed, who's here, but Martha suggested maybe we tell the students that uh, that statue has been there since 1741. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, if you kiss the top of her head, you're going to get really great grades. And we would see out the back window kids sort of surreptitiously yeah. walking up to kiss. Yeah. I, is that... Tradition. Nursing school would have been so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> oh my! But traditions, so traditions like this are are um, really make places special. But I agree with Herman. I think it's the closeness of the community, the kind of unpretentious students who uh, come here right. um, to this college uh, that make it so special. For me, the Moravian tradition, the music, uh, the chances are there that uh, uh, we were able to hear at the college and in Central Church. And of course, the setting of the college, um, not he only here, but also in historic Bethlehem, which made it such a special place for us. Right. Dr. Tomford, I know that you just retired. Mm -hmm. But is there anything from your tenureship that you would like to see continue um, throughout the rest and the future of Moravian? Sure. I, th I think one of the great <clears throat> traditions of, of uh, Moravian is its uh, ethos of service coming from the original Moravians who came here to be of service to 
Native American populations when others came to abuse them or take their land. And uh, to have a kind of commitment to service <clears throat> that's shaped by liberal learning. So you're, you're not just a sap or a or sappy liberal, as, as some might call me or others, but that you, you have an intelligence that has been shaped by the liberal arts, and you have a, a community base from which to go, like Moravian, and that you also have uh, acquired specific skills, nursing, education, accounting, mm -hmm. uh, to name just some, that would enable you to serve with empathy and intelligence, especially to those who are on the fringes of society. I, right. I think that's part of, part of our ethos. I don't see it in, in my alma mater, for right. example. But I see it here, and I experienced it here. I, I see it in the lives of our alums. And I see it in you. And I, I think I would, I would hope that that would always continue, regardless of the shape of the curriculum or specific uh, yeah. ways that we talk about ourselves, how to serve intelligently <laughs> those who are on the fringe, I think is crucial, a crucial tradition here. <clears throat> and going off of that, that's perfect, because it leads mm -hmm. right into my next question for Dr. Martin. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. Um, when choosing a liberal arts college, uh, students have a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of things to deal with, specifically uh, the false thought that liberal arts students learn a lot about a little, I mean, a little about a lot, uh, Sometimes nothing yeah. really useful. Yeah, yeah. I've there known many students who learn a little about <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost nothing. Little about a little, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> man, I thought I was Free. I thought I was graduating with, with getting by and nobody noticed. <laughs> so I'm interested, especially with our pre-professional programs, where you see that fitting in with the liberal arts and where you see liberal arts really changing and evolving over the years and how Moravian has fit into that and survived for so long um, through all of these stereotypes that you see with liberal arts colleges. Well, when I came here in 1986, uh, I was, and still am in many ways, committed to the idea of a liberal arts and science education. What happened to me is after being here, I then also saw the value in having pre-professional programs. And thus, uh, we have the nursing program, which really began uh, to be put in place while I was here. But I think the thing about the liberal arts, why they're very important, and, and I don't want to see the liberal arts and sciences change, because what we do with liberal arts and science, and in pre-professional programs, you know, everybody here gets at least two years of exposure to the, the sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, uh, to language, to art, to music. Um, this really prepares students to think creatively and outside the box, to really appreciate uh, the finer things in our society. And as I realize now uh, in retirement, and my bet is my colleagues would say the same thing, these, what I, what I picked up in the liberal arts and sciences uh, were an important part of my life, but especially now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is something that also, and, and the other thing that's important is it gives us intellectual flexibility. We know now that, that our, this generation of students coming to college now will not just have one career, like maybe my father did, but are gonna have as many as seven or eight completely different careers. And I think that what the liberal arts and sciences do is prepare you for your first job, but really prepare you for what your last job is gonna be, which might be very different. Right. So I think it's very important to keep that right. uh, in, in higher education. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> that was a loaded question there, it was very impressive. <laughs> Dr. Tomford, do you have any thoughts to add? Yes, I, th I think uh, one thing I learned here amongst many things was that even in our pre-professional programs, as, as Rusty has said, I think they are, they are approached <clears throat> not as skill training, how to be a teacher, how to be a nurse, how to be an accountant, how to be a manager, but what are the concepts involved so that in an ever-changing world, I, I can, as Rusty said, think clearly about my work. I, I think the other piece which the liberal arts can help us with is to give us a broader sense of vocation. 
What are my gifts? Uh, how can I recognize them? How can they be shaped intellectually and professionally? And <clears throat> where is the need of the world? So where would, a vocation, I think, has to do with my passions, my gifts intersecting at a point where the world is wounded. And having a Moravian education, I would have the moral courage to live out my life in that intersection of, of giftedness and woundedness. Thank you. Dr. Collier, you knew it was coming. You had the most time to prep. <laughs> so? <laughs> so, that means nothing, Trevor. Uh, well, what are your thoughts? I, I, the idea of professional studies is, of course, a pretty commonplace, has a pretty commonplace in the liberal arts world these days. Many, many liberal arts colleges have done so. I think the reality is something has already been spoken to in that Every profession has its need to be mindful of and, abil and have an ability to be appreciative of the world about it. And the world about it is just simply a, a whole variety of people and the associations they bring to the culmination of whatever the professional life might be. So I think the idea of it, of it being a great stimulus for deep thinking, even along very professional lines enhances the strength of that profession in a way as to have more outreach of goodness to people that are around it. So it's, I think, very compatible with the liberal arts. And you know, even as I did an interim with an uh, all-women's college, happens to be at Salem in, in uh, Winston-Salem, we even there moved from having nothing in the way of uh, uh, professional studies to those because women were moving into the areas where professional studies and professional opportunities were growing. And these young ladies were doing magnificent things in bringing the culmination of matching that skill with otherwise the liberalness of thought and the appreciation for other thoughts that are shared by people that they have in their environment or their work scene. Right. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, a yes, uh, story comes to my mind. I once met a uh, a man who has now passed away, but at that time was a distinguished judge in New York City, Harold Medina. <clears throat> and in the early 50s, he was responsible for a series of trials uh, involving kind of a red scare and the McCarthy era uh, in that period. <clears throat> and uh, during one of these trials, he related to a group of us that he was sequestered uh, because the trials were highly controversial and, and dangerous to him and the other people involved. So his clerk came to him and said, uh, Judge Medina, uh, you're going to be sequestered in this uh, hotel. Do you want us to bring you the relevant law text? Do you want us to bring you the relevant uh, studies, briefs on, on these cases? He said, oh no, I, I do that during the day. I would like you to bring me the complete works of Charles Dickens. <laughs> And I will read those at night because Charles Dickens gives me an indication of what the human story is all about. Mm -hmm. I'm trained professionally as a judge and I'll do my best between nine and five, but at night I need to know about the human story as well. And I, and I often thought that's a great uh, uh, way of thinking about liberal arts plus pro uh, professional execution of a responsibility. If we can get all prospective students to hear that story, I think <laughs> yeah. have much better enrollment. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be incredible. All right, so Dr. Tofford, mm -hmm. question for you. Um, would you be able to share with us uh, a situation where you had to deal with maybe a crisis or a really exciting moment where most of your students, most of your faculty may not have known about at the time mm -hmm. um, that really caused you some trouble either sleeping or really some anxiety as the president. <laughs> I don't know how that would happen at all. Right. <laughs> um, but I've heard it, it's a common problem. So could you give me some insight? Yeah, I, I, the one that immediately springs to mind, and I, I don't know if Dennis Domchek is here, uh, <clears throat> but he, uh, as it were, saved my bacon, saved the bacon of the school that day. Uh, some, some time, I want to say it was October 8th in uh, 2008, the great economic crash was happening all around us. I happily walked up Main Street from our house, and I was met at Colonial Hall by Julie Del Giorno, and she said, Chris, we have a real crisis. Um, 
but come on upstairs. Dennis is there, and we're going to talk about this. And maybe Mark Reed and Ann Reed were there also. <clears throat> so I went up to my office, and uh, Dennis said, I have bad news. Uh, Wachovia Bank has frozen all the assets of the college. Uh, they are the trustees of what is called the Common Fund, and there was about $9 billion of assets frozen by Wachovia Bank uh, in, from schools like Stanford, Moravian, and uh, several hundred others. We, we had about $20 million in the Common Fund. It was the tuition that had come in. So that money was no longer available to us for use. We had about $700,000, I think, in account here uh, in one of the banks in Bethlehem. So we had $700,000 to run the school for the rest of the year. And to me, a bad morning is when I don't have milk for my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dennis and many other people got on the line. I had a brief conversation with one of the representatives of Wachovia, and he said, well, you know, our, we're about to go bankrupt, and unless we freeze these assets, um, the bank will fail. And I said, that must be awful. That money is not, <laughs> that money is not yours. Right. You're a trustee. That money belongs to my students and, my, and the faculty who are, they are sharing that money with the faculty to provide them with um, instruction. So the sooner we can get this money back, the better we'll all be. And Dennis and a bunch of other people worked out a formula. I mm -hmm. think by the time of the following March, we got our $20 million back. But it was very, very touch and go for all of, uh, for major portions of 2008, not knowing if we would have resources from day to day that might be frozen or uh, assimilated into one of the major banks who are also facing trouble. So thanks to De Dennis, uh, thanks to uh, Mark, Reed. Mark Reed, Ann Reed, we did get that money back. That, that was a really very, very bad day. And, and students probably had no idea how much no. touch and go it was. Right. And you're probably smiling around talking to students <laughs> like normal. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. That's pretty incredible. <clears throat> Dr. Collier, do you have any thoughts of any situations that you had when you were the president here um, that may have not been common knowledge throughout the campus that was a real disaster for you? Well, hearing that particular story, I would say, no, I guess I did not. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> no, all sunshine, right? We, we, um, I really think that uh, the times were of a different sort and that perhaps that had something to do with, such as obviously the economic stress and strain of that period did not occur. Or we had events that were maybe white knuckle type of operations mm -hmm. from time to time, but I can recall back in my earliest uh, time as a president, we had some international war situations going, and I had a particular staff member come into the office one day to say that if I didn't do something to help assist stopping that, that the library might be burned, mm -hmm. uh, and that there were some threats uh, for other kinds of activities from some of the students that were... Uh, involved with the same protest type of thing. Um, that all seemed to go away with time, and it wasn't so much an answer that I could provide as it was that the situation itself became so much better known and understood that uh, some of those folks uh, moderated their position. Not all did, and some decided that if, in fact, the institution was going to keep its stance uh, as simply being a bystander observer, observer of that, that they probably could not continue their association with the institution. And I simply bid farewell. It's <laughs> a good way to deal with some things. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Martin, do you have any thoughts on well, this? Well, this is kind of cheating, uh, but it uh, is well. an opportunity to bring Irv Rocky uh, into mm -hmm. the conversation. Okay. Because uh, he, I think, went through the same experience I did. I th now, this is when I was president at another college after Reagan at Randolph-Macon, and it was 9-11. We had it. been the day before um, talking to uh, one of our investment managers in the World Trade Center, uh, and then 9-11 happened, and all those people who had been on the telephone conversation with us about one of our investments died in that. But at the same time, 
uh, four, uh, five students at Randolph-Macon lost their parents in the Pentagon uh, bombing. We often up here think about uh, the World Trade Center, right. but it was also the Pentagon. And so simultaneously having to, having to really struggle with what had just happened to these people we knew, knew personally, uh, but now to call up, uh, tell these students, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what presidents at small colleges have to do, was just, uh, to me, mm -hmm. something I had to do, but I'll never forget that. And, I, and Irv, you know, was president here then, and I'm sure he was going through the same, uh, the same thing uh, uh, with, with uh, students or people in this community. I can imagine being a student with that workload yes. and getting a phone call like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some time here, and I'm curious, uh, with, with all of your qualifications, um, why did you, and I'm talking to Dr. Tomford now, um, why did you decide to spend so much of your time here at Moravian? Why was this such a magnet for you? Um, and why did you stay here? Mm -hmm. well, I, I, uh, for a number of reasons. I had met uh, Rocco Calvo quite a long time ago <clears throat> in the uh, early 1960s. My college basketball coach uh, was raised by the Calvo family on the, on the south side. Their house has now been demolished. But uh, so Rocco Calvo would come to a lot of our games and, and uh, was, was impressed me as a, a great man. So that's when I first heard about uh, Moravian. And then um, <clears throat> when I uh, applied to be uh, president here upon, on the occasion of uh, Dr. Rocky's retirement, uh, my wife Kathy and I were immediately struck by the students. We th I, I, they seemed to be um, capable uh, modest, let's get an education, let's get on with our lives. Uh, my father was an immigrant. My grandfather could not read or write uh, on my mother's side. I was a first generation student. There seemed to be lots of first generation students here who uh, were probably going through some of the similar, not the same as, but similar experiences I had had. So I, I really like that. Uh, I'm a Lutheran minister, and I really like the fact that there was a seminary here. That, that, made, uh, that meant a lot to me. How, what's the relationship of a seminary to a college? What's the future of the church? Um, the church into which I was ordained doesn't exist anymore, e either legally or in any way, shape, or form. So where, how, would you, how could we deal with that problem as well as how could we help students who seem to have such terrific promise and, uh, and, a, and a great trajectory to their lives, how could we continue to shape them and launch them? So I, I was struck uh, by those two pieces. And um, finally, I guess I would say the, the people with whom I worked every day in the president's office, the senior staff, uh, the faculty, I had a great deal of admiration. They, they went through a very difficult time financially, but always were creative and how can we do this better? So, Right. I, I feel very lucky and privileged to uh, have been invited to come. Thank you. Hmm. Dr. Collier, any thoughts? And, and, and Mr. Hank Barnett um, asked me to give you a hard time about how um, <laughs> you had a very difficult he time told, holding he a told job. Me so. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> but any thoughts about why Moravian was attractive to you? Why, and you held numerous positions as presidents at numerous other colleges, and you spent a significant amount of your time here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why is that? Well, in some way, uh, Jerry and I have talked about this sort of thing for, frequently. Uh, it almost seemed as predestined that we would get here. Mm. Uh, I have connections that I didn't realize were connections at all, that uh, in my coming to Lehigh University for my graduate work, that all of a sudden begin to blossom. Uh, Jerry winds up getting to be the secretary to the dean of the graduate school at, at Lehigh, who happens to be a, a close friend of uh, the president here, Ray Hoppert, particularly around the rotary table. And it turns out that one of the faculty members here, this would be now in about 1951, had to go off to service again. And um, so chemistry was a not an easy place to find teachers anyway. And so Dr. Halpert was talking with the dean of the graduate school at Lehigh about possibility of someone that could pinch hit while this particular faculty member was away. 
And uh, lo and behold, if I don't come out to be the person, I'm in my second teaching year as a teaching assistant at Lehigh. And um, Dr. Neville, who was the dean of the graduate school, suggested that maybe I should go over and talk to Moravian. We happen also to be living in an apartment of a Moravian family right on Church Street within sight of the Women's College and Central Moravian Church, which got to be our church in the short while we were here. And so that the Moravian connection of things began to kind of bubble up and become more and more significant. And I came over and uh, Dr. Hopper thought it'd be fine if we allowed for me to do the one-term teaching. It was in an all-men's college. The women's college and merger thing came about a year later. And so I did that. And from then on, uh, the, the acquaintance that we had uh, simply continued as a friendship. And yet I could see and maybe feel as well as I approached my conclusion on the doctorate program that uh, it might be a possibility for me to be on the faculty here at the college. I will tell you all, because it's, I think, a fairly humorous and kind of unusual story, my appointment that Dr. Hopper offered to me here as I was getting my doctorate degree was that I could come as full professor with tenure. And that, I, that wow. was probably something that they had only seen me ha be here for one semester at that point. So I did arrive at that way. And uh, of course, the, the connection between the church, where Jerry and I had established ourselves as simply a couple, was independent of it all. But nonetheless, it had a relationship to the institution in a way that it meant a great deal to us. And the reception that we received here from the people, beginning with Ray Hopper and um, all, all the faculty members that we knew at that time, it, it seemed as though we were simply coming back into a, a family kind of a relationship. And so our place felt right for us. And it continued that way. In fact, my absence from the institution for six years while I was with DuPont, which happened to come about for reasons of Sputnik and the technology that was happening to my field, that I had to kind of catch up with that pretty quickly. But as we spent our years with DuPont, it became evident that teaching in the collegiate world was where we ought to be. And where we ought to be was Moravian. And so Dr. Culp, who was then the chair of the department and was a fellow grad student with me at Lehigh, and I invited him to come to be this. And Stu and I knew that I was just coming back to be part of the staff and that uh, he was happy about that as well, and so we got along as great partners. It was really the magnetism of the people of Moravian and the institution itself that brought me here. And so having the privilege of serving as the president, well, I could hardly imagine the opportunity of full satisfaction that came as a result of that for the reasons of the heartfelt care and feeling that we had grown to have for the institution which is kind of unique. It doesn't happen. Unfortunately, these fellows didn't get the infection that I had. So <laughs> <laughs> it made, made a big difference in my life. I oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Dr. Martin. Well, for me, it's just something that kind of happened, which was rather miraculous. I mean, I was uh, a dean at Harvard at the pinnacle of higher education. Chris would disagree. He'd say Princeton's the pinnacle of, of higher education. But... <laughs> Pinnacle of one mountain. <laughs> Some would say in a range of mountains. I was, a, I was associate dean in the Divinity School, surrounded by all of these uh, theologians. And what I really wanted, what I was really missing, and this sort of comes back to the liberal arts we were talking about, was I wanted to really know people outside my area. I wanted to know physicists, and I wanted to know people in chemistry, and I wanted to know uh, other folks. And I, I was 43. Brian, how old are you now? So was I, am I younger than you? 45. What? 45. Okay, so I, 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 be, I was younger than Brian coming here. I was 43. This and isn't a competition. All of a sudden. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the, the Moravian position uh, came up. Uh, George Rupp, who had been the dean, had gone on to be president of Rice, so it was a good time for me to, to leave. But it was Moravian, and my ancestors were Ger German Moravians who came to Lidditz uh, um, uh, 
in that Moravian community. I'm a church historian. I'm, I'm not a Moravian, I'm a Quaker, but I had deep appreciation for who the Moravians uh, were and are. Uh, it was a liberal arts college, a small one, where I could, I could uh, have, have those friendships with people outside my, my very narrow uh, my, my, my very narrow discipline. And uh, I was interviewed at Newark Airport, really enjoyed talking uh, to the Board of Trustees. And uh, you know, the rest is history. But then being here, uh, we came with two, uh, two young daughters. They were brought up in this community. They went to Moravian Academy. They lived in, uh, where, 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 uh, in the president's house. And this became their home. And this is just the kind of place that, you know, you're here and it becomes part of you. It really does. Yeah. And I think the most difficult thing for me was actually to, I was in my 11th year, I was uh, 52, I had another presidency in me, was really leaving Bethlehem. I could have stayed, I guess. I felt that 10 year cycles probably made sense. Herman was here much longer than uh, just, uh, just uh, 10 years, which, which, is, which is great too. But it was, it was time for me to go, but it was really hard leaving. Yeah. So whenever I come back, and just before coming here, I'm just walking around the community and yeah. remembering back to when, uh, when we lived here. And it's just a very special college and a very special community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, we could do this probably all night, um, but I think some people might want to go home eventually. So <laughs> what, I, what I'm curious about, is there any questions from the audience that we might have anybody in particular? We have. Three very intelligent gentlemen and me up here, so I'm just curious <laughs> if there's any questions anybody came here with. We have great support on Twitter, which is really exciting, and if anybody's checking the Twitter account, it's been, it's been raving. Um, but I want to hear from maybe students that are here or maybe past alumni. Um, I think, yeah, all right, brilliant. Scott. I'm a graduate of Moravian. I'm also an employee of Moravian. My name is Julia Gustaska, and um, I work in the development office. So I'd be very curious to know if each of you have a memorable story meeting with an alumnus or an alumna of Moravian, um, without going into too much detail because that person might be here. So, you know, <laughs> but some kind of memorable story that has, has stuck with you to this point. I think we'd all probably say Prill Heard. She's not here with us right now. She's in a better place. But uh, she's the kind of uh, philanthropist that, for me at least, and I was a fundraising president, that was just a joy to, to know. She really cared about this college, uh, even though she didn't go here. Uh, you see her name um, all over the place. But in my mind, um, Prill probably is one of the, the, the most important <laughs> philanthropist I've worked with in my career uh, in higher education. I might just jump in on that and that uh, Pearl and I met uh, at the time that she was not involved with the institution and uh, I know that it, as I sat on the veranda of her home and we were talking about um, the institution, the college itself, and her interests in general, and I was busy working my way around to where I could pop the question, so to speak. And um, actually, uh, she made it very easy because she, clear, uh, she made a very clear statement about what her priorities in life were in terms of heart-directed issues and, and wishes for what might occur. And when I really said very specifically, well, we would think very highly of the possibility of our com your coming together with us and serving as a trustee. And she said, well, why not? And uh, I remember that we went off to a meeting to um, learn about trusteeship in small colleges. This was something that she had hoped to do, and we went together to do that. And it was a marvelous experience because being with her away from the scene itself, while we had to talk about ourselves and the whole matter of where our enthusiasm in life might be. And it was very clear that uh, she had a heart and a feeling of need to be involved in the education, particularly in the private sector. And that Moravian at that point was one that she was going to be most interested in. And you know very well from her philanthropy in the area itself here that it's broader than just that. But I agree uh, with the comments made about uh, the value that she brought to the institution and the quality of life she had. 
that she offered to everybody, and uh, it was a, an unusual opportunity to have her adopt this institution in the way that she had and the, and the things she's made possible for us to do in the way we want to do them. So that's an unusual blessing. A couple of other trustees were similar, and so one of the things I remember about coming at the time I did of the merger of the institutions and all, we did, uh, had to think carefully about the Board of Trustees and the structure that pretty much exists today, although somewhat modified today, is it one that we gave birth to during that period, to have a seminary board as well as a college board, since the seminary wasn't able to have quite the voice when it was simply a committee of the board rather than a board itself. And um, it was an opportunity to bring some other people into the institution that made quite a difference as well. And it happened in the seminary with folks that were coming there. But uh, Delight Bridegham is a, another name that I would say was particularly important. And Plum Gee is an alumna of the institution. And her husband was with DuPont and became president of the international paper, Ed Gee. And they, are, they were another name. So that we began to amplify the presence of Moravian with its trustee leadership. And it gave us some more credibility and uh, obvious notability in a larger society, which has meant a great deal to us in terms of expanded friendships. Herman, got to mention Vanjie Smith, too, in the uh, southern yeah. province. Uh, she really cared for the uh, theological yep. seminary. One of the great things about being president here, Brian, for you, too, is getting, being able to go down to Winston-Salem. Yep. And uh, that, that community is well, you know the history of Bethlehem and Winston-Salem, but they really see the seminary here, at least, as, as part, of, part of them. I would add, uh, <clears throat> I was very impressed by the trustees of the seminary. <clears throat> um, mostly people of modest means. Vanji at that time, was not on the uh, trustees. <clears throat> but they together pledged a million dollars towards a $15 million campaign uh, to advance the seminary, and I, I thought that was remarkable. Yes, there are major people who have had a major impact on the college mm -hmm. uh, and the seminary, but I was very, very impressed by the seminary trustees making that kind of commitment. I, on a, since it's Lent, I must tell a story against myself in, in uh, fundraising, uh, I was uh, in Chicago at a wonderful restaurant called The Rhapsody. It's in the area where the Chicago um, Symphony plays, uh, off of Michigan Avenue, across from the Art Institute. And uh, I went to meet a young couple there. Um, we, they were very uh, kind of, uh, unlike me, handsome and, and chic, all dressed in black, you know, very thin and fit. We had a very... Uh, uh, even though this was a wonderful restaurant, there was like water and watercress and, you know, hummus was sort of the <laughs> meal. And uh, while I was talking to this couple, around me I could see uh, in, in some restaurants there's a little like push cart with all kinds of wonderful desserts on, mousse, cakes, cupcakes, pies, all kinds of things. So in the corner, from my basketball training, I can see over this far. So, Sometimes that comes in handy. Yeah, all, all, I can see this card going back and forth. I'm with this wonderful couple, but very uh, healthy, you know, way too healthy for me. <laughs> and we, we talked about uh, the school. They made a, a very generous gift. We left, and I, and I, uh, I did something shameful, but it's Lent. I, went, I waited till they were out of sight. <laughs> I walked around the block, down Michigan Avenue, Monroe Street, I can't remember the next one up, uh, LaSalle, Ma Madison, back down. I looked again and I went back in, and at my own cost, not at the college's cost. I said, the waiter said, uh, you were just here, did you forget something? I said, you know, I would really like one of those desserts. Could you just push that card over to my table? I'll sit in the corner. <laughs> Bring me some coffee. So I had like two or three desserts over there. <laughs> and then left. So not, not all presidents are noble, alas. <laughs> that was hysterical. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to get to this place. Well, we got there. We got there. Somehow we got there. All right, brilliant. Do we have any other questions from everybody? Yes, we have a bunch of hands being raised. Um, 
We have a microphone coming up behind you. Hi, Bob Huth, class of 72. Actually, 76, started in 72. Uh, this is for Dr. Collier, and it's about tra uh, traditions. So, whatever happened to the dink? Whatever happened to the dink? The dink that the uh, first years would wear. Yeah, a little cap. How did that go out of style? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. It, 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 the season for dinks, it kind of across the board, faded about that same time. Yeah. Believe it or not, I still have a dink from Randolph-Macon College, what I wore a <laughs> hundred years ago. Can we explain what that is for, you know, me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it, freshmen were identified by a cap they wore. It didn't fit anything. And it just, it sort of sat on top of your head. It had even a little bill on it. And frequently it was the colors of the, of the college, of course, in, in question. And had some identification uh, letter-wise. I guess this had MC on it, as I recall. But that was gone. It was around during the days when I was still a Lehigh grad student that was teaching here. But I, I don't know what happened. It, it just faded away from almost all institutions, and we were a part of that. Bring, why don't you bring that back? Yeah. No, it got replaced by the confused look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all it is now. Yeah. You can clearly identify freshmen. Yeah. 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 All right, really, I, I had no idea there was a, there was a well, dink. I, I see it. Has, it, dink? it. It has really disappeared. Dink? Classy, classy. <laughs> actually, it, actually uh, Lynn Chenoweth, is it your grandfather, Lynn? Graduated here, I think, in 1908. I'm not so good at numbers. He's in the class of 1908. And the student trustee who graduated that day, uh, Lynn, uh, gave her grandfather's dink to uh, oh. him when he graduated in 2008. So that was. I still have my dink, if anyone wants it. So tomorrow we're going to have show and tell. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I have desserts. <laughs> you bring the desserts. One right in the middle there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a question right in the middle. Um, thanks, Scott. Hi, I'm Brian Dixon. I uh, graduated from the seminary in 2005. And my question for you is, as, as president, you're presiding over the learning, over the self-discovery of hundreds of people. But I dare say, and I suspect that maybe you yourselves are also on a journey. Uh, you are learners as you are here serving in that role, and I was just wondering, I would be interested to hear each of you offer a little bit of reflection on maybe what was maybe the single greatest or one of the most significant self-learnings uh, that you came to uh, during your, your term as president. So. Yep. I'm not gonna answer that, Dr. Tosser. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me like I have the answer. <laughs> let, let me take a quick try it, just I may like to come back and say something even more so, but uh, it maybe wasn't peculiar to the experience here, but it certainly was a high point of emphasis within it. Learning to listen, learning to listen. And the more that was done conscientiously, deliberately, thoughtfully, the better your response always was. And the better it was to serve those persons that had the questions to begin with, or the comments to make, the protests, whatever it was, whatever form. But listening and therefore digesting it in a way as to be articulate in coming back with what is your best judgment, having given it some time to really uh, formulate and, and be thoughtful about. This was a small thing for me, but I remember I was here maybe three or four years uh, meeting a, a freshman in a wheelchair. Okay. And uh, I'd become really interested in what it must be like <clears throat> to, uh, to come to college with a physical disability. And this was a time when we we're all putting ramps in and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So what I did is I got the, uh, uh, Martha maybe can remember this, I got the whole senior staff to get wheelchairs and go around campus in wheelchairs oh, wow. to really understand uh, what these students um, have to go through. One of the great things about uh, Moravian is it's pretty much flat, at least up here. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult down on the, the uh, Church Street campus. Yeah. But uh, Brian, that I, you, know, you might do that because it gives you a, a, a real appreciation for how hard it is 
for somebody with that kind of disability or who sight impaired or blind to be able to negotiate a college campus? I, I think, uh, I'm not sure that I learned it, or, but am learning or was learning, how, how to put together <clears throat> a process whereby all of the many constituencies, one day I counted up, I thought there were 17 very different constituencies here at the college, how to give each one an appropriate voice at what time to make a decision. I, I've, I found that a great, a great challenge. Uh, some people have louder voices than others. Some are wiser than others. Some should be coming forth and taking responsibility at a certain time. Others have no responsibility at that particular right. moment, but believe they do. So, and, and, in, and especially given what Herm said earlier, the nature of the community is so strong here, and you have people who are committed on campus and off campus in the town, the Moravian Church at large, all over the place. How, how, can, you get, how can you discover a process whereby people can speak and are listened to appropriately at the right time so you end up with the best possible decision on some, of, on some very difficult complicated questions, and then how do you communicate the decision to all those communities? Right. Some people will be happy, some people are sad, some people are angry, some people are mad. It's a large yeah. umbrella. Yeah, yeah. so oh. the, the whole issue of, I would, sort of a fancy term, deliberative justice. How do you, how do you think through a problem with 17 different voices, right. uh, all with legitimate insights and commitments? And you got to file through all of it. Yeah. It's not easy. No. Um, all right, so it's 9 o'clock. We have a half hour left, and we have a brilliant another question coming up. Perfect. 9 o'clock's my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> We're retired now. You know, That's, That's what Joseph you gave Powell. up for staying up late. Joseph Paulette, recently retired in the physics department. Um, I'm really fortunate to have known and worked under each yeah. of you, <laughs> including Ray Hoppert yes. and Irv Rocky. Uh, I remember how I felt about, felt about Ray Hopper, but I wonder if each of you could tell me uh, how each of you would like to be remembered at, by Moravian College. They didn't make that easy. No, no. <laughs> can, can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Jo Joe, maybe I'm not gonna answer your question directly, but I think what I realize about college presidency and successful colleges is it's not just what one of us does. Right. I, think it, I think what it is, and I'll, and I'll say this in a very personal way, um, I had a lot of success fundraising here, but what I realized is I was successful because this man to my left uh, did a lot of cultivation and fundraising before me. And I would think uh, that Irv, if Irv was here, mm -hmm. uh, Irv would, would say that, that the fundraising he did, so it's sort of handing, um, uh, handing the baton forward, yeah. and each president builds, and, and it's not just the president either, Joe, it's the, as you know, it's the, the faculty and the administration hopefully working together as much as possible, but it's kind of a continuous movement forward. And I think this college, one of the reasons why this college uh, is, is, has been so successful is it's had a steady uh, group of presidents. We, we're not having a president every two years. Um, and I think the passing of the, the baton on to each other um, is, is something I'd want to say about what, what, what we all do together. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I, uh, I would heartily agree there in my, when I'm not eating desserts, I like to read uh, literature. And there's a wonderful essay by uh, T.S. Eliot called Tradition and the Individual Talent. And uh, I, I take it that we're, we, the presidents, are in a, in a kind of tradition and um, the decisions of those who went before us shape, in many ways, uh, our decisions. But each of us has to find his or her own voice accordingly. And uh, so I, I would, uh, I echo. would uh, echo uh, Rusty's sentiment here. I think um, 
when I, when I came to Moravian, to answer your question more directly, Joe, when I came, uh, uh, Gordy Weil, who was just uh, elected to be the dean, he and I imagined all kinds of things, and with the board of trustees of the seminary and the college, we put together a strategic plan that had all kinds of wonderful ideas in it, <clears throat> and then the whole economy collapsed. And uh, we, we uh, the senior staff, the faculty, the trustees, I think my goal at that point was how do we preserve the mission of the college in the midst of uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, snowstorms, bank uh, collapses, how do we preserve this mission and, and get it through to a more stable point? And um, I think we did that, and, and I'm delighted that Brian is here now. Uh, and I hope he will not have to, I don't mean this facetiously, I hope he never has to face those kinds of issues, which many of you who are trustees and uh, many of you who are faculty members, members of the senior staff have to face. I think Brian has, uh, to, again, to use Roger's uh, metaphor, imagination and can imagine new things to do now that we're, we're through, uh, th through this uh, very, very, turbulent and uh, uncertain period. Demographic decline, economic decline, uh, no confidence in the federal government. Uh, these are not happy times in, in which to be uh, serving, but a privileged time. So hopefully we have passed on to you, Brian, a, an institution that has a rich tradition and is stable and go, f go ahead, go forward. Thank you. Joe, if there was a particular quality that I would hope folks would think of my past association would be there's no question by what he cared and the evidence that they could tick off as what symptoms did I exhibit that sort of proved the point would be easily identified and stand out in a way that no one else would say that isn't so, it, that, it, that he simply cared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. To it, Professor Sipple. She doesn't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're alike. That's it. That's all it is. Uh, it would be. And my name is Janet Sipple, and I had the pleasure to fall madly in love with Bethlehem, even though I am a dyed in the wool Southerner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to have been associated with the birth of uh, the nursing program here with Rusty Martin uh, and Bob Huth and many others who fought to bring this program to Moravian. We wanted the solid foundation of a liberal arts education for a nurse who may uh, serve you all in times of need and crisis. And we are happy of our union and our marriage and think it is very successful and to the benefit of the Liberal Arts College as well as to the nurses we're preparing at all levels. But this evening cannot end without recognizing the young man who's moderating this hey. panel, <laughs> who is an excellent example of bringing together a strong, well-educated person who will move forward to make a difference in the profession of nursing science. Who didn't arrive ready for that at all. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to you. Back to Sipple, I appreciate that a lot. We will not tell any stories. No. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> do we have any other questions um, for the president's panel? There's a gentleman over here. I think. We, have, we do. Okay, perfect. Oh, okay. oh we there's Hickey. Or Jim. Hello, my name is... Uh, oh, you're yeah, Jim. I'll, I'll make it a quick question, Hickey. My name is Jim West. I'm a time. professor here of economics and business for, for many years. And I want to say it's really wonderful to see you all back and really, really a pleasure for the faculty to see their, their leaders back. 
Um, my question was that uh, Brian has been talking to the faculty about the future of the liberal arts college and has introduced this concept of the new American liberal arts college or the new liberal arts college. And I just wonder, what does that term mean to you, the new liberal arts college? I've had some experience with it elsewhere. I, I, what, it has, what it has meant to me is um, imagining a future where you have the, um, the fission of these great, great <clears throat> historical educational traditions, one of the liberal arts, as we've talked about, how to, how to think, how to, how to relate, how to appreciate, how to become a, an interesting and, and decent human being, the, the kind of person you'd want to be in a lifeboat with, for example. Uh, the, and how do we provide, uh, just as what Janet Sippel had just said, uh, professional training and uh, skill to be a citizen, to be employed and successful, and to do that with a sense of uh, vocation a sense of calling, a sense of high purpose or sacred, sacred grounding, not just how do I make a buck and how do I improve my status at the expense of those around me. Uh, so I, I, as I understand the New American College it's, it's, or the university, trying to think through how, how, do, we, how do we do that? And uh, that's, that's not quite so easy. And, and I think, the, the, as I understand it, the other schools of which we've been a part often come out of this religious tradition. They're small liberal arts colleges, and they have this combination that is here at, at um, Moravian of the liberal arts uh, experience as well as some particular uh, pre-professional programs as well, plus providing uh, access to men and women who may otherwise be excluded or rebuffed at um, small liberal arts colleges. So those, those are some of the ingredients that I know of the, of the concept. I don't know that I'm as up to date on what might be brewing in terms of an alternative for liberal arts. But um, I guess to the extent that I've seen it in several other institutions, and then I did through numbers that I visited while I was finding presidents and deans over a 12-year period across the country, uh, the liberal arts institutions, which happened to be my forte and where I was all the time in the private sector, it's a crude way of saying it, but it ain't broke, so I don't know that it needs to be <laughs> fixed. Yeah. I think it's, it's in that sense. Uh, I think we need to honor it maybe in a more yes. intensive and an intentional way, but that comes with the choice of who the faculty and the leadership of that faculty would be because they can care for that. I'd like to say something about the delivery of liberal arts education because we're in the middle of a technological revolution uh, in how education is delivered. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking here not just about MOOCs. Do you all know yeah. what MOOCs are? Yeah. No. This is the idea. You don't? No. Does anybody else? Everybody knows? Never mind. Skip. Skip. <laughs> everybody else these, knows these but are, me. These That's are okay. massive online courses. Okay. So you don't even have to leave your home. You can just sort of dial into your computer and one professor uh, lecturing from here or from wherever can reach hundreds of thousands of students and you can really lower the cost of what, what the delivery is. Okay. And I don't, I, I think that we have to take seriously this technology because I, I believe we need to appropriately appropriate it mm -hmm. uh, because I think it can improve the way education is done, but I don't think you can ever replace a professor in a class, hopefully with a small group of, of students, mm -hmm. right. um, just, just not going to be the same quality um, of education. And going back to an hour ago, that's what we were discussing, made Moravian so great. I know myself the nursing staff, it was, it was just absolutely incredible. There was every need that you could have was met. Um, so it's just a sticky area to navigate. I think most of the faculty here would, would agree with me yeah. that a lot of education, I mean, with the MOOC, once the uh, computer goes off, that's the end of it. Right. But a lot of education happens 
after the class is over and the student has, still has a question, you know, they didn't maybe understand everything Joe said in his physics course or, or Jim said in, in, in his business economics course, right. they want to talk to the professor <clears throat> afterwards informally about what happened. And that, that's got to happen in a person to person. And, and one last thing, places like Moravian are where uh, adolescents really grow up. They come here uh, as adolescents and they begin that process of becoming adults. And that happens through being on sports teams, through writing for the newspaper, uh, for serving on a board of trustees. And that cannot happen in, in your parents' living room. No. It happens on a residential campus. So I think it's um, both the way education, liberal arts will be delivered, which I hope doesn't change too drastically, and really the place of, of, a, of a residential college in American higher education. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question and then we'll sum it up. So please, yeah. All right, thank you. My name is uh, Heike Lemp. I'm uh, teaching German and European history here at Moravian College since 2001, since 9-11. Um, and continuing to Tim uh, West uh, questions, I would like to ask actually, what do you consider historically and, and also into the future the role and status of Moravian College? Are we a regional college or are we a national liberal arts college? How was it actually in your time and how is it actually currently and what are our options for the future? Thank you. Well, I think Zinzendorf and certainly Comenius would have said that this is the movement is an international movement. And I think the problem uh, is, is to, and I believe uh, a place like Moravian and Chris and Herm have articulated this, ought to be really a much more international uh, institution. At least the heritage, the German Moravian, Czech Moravian heritage is very much an international one. And I think that ought to give this institution some clue as to what direction it maybe ought to be going in in the future. But that's just the way I feel about it. My sense would be de facto, it's a, it's a regional school, and I was very happy about that. Um, I live in Minnesota right now. Not a lot of people there know about schools in Pennsylvania. I lived in Kansas for a while. I remember a young boy <clears throat> that I tried to recruit to go to my alma mater. What, well, why would, I, why, would I, why would I go to Princeton? I'm going to Dade County Community College. It's right near my town, and uh, I can go there for free. So I, I think most students go to schools about 150, 200 miles from where they are. We're lucky that we're in quite a population uh, area. Who, who there can benefit by the new American college model and, and an international scope? I, th I think that's how I, I think about it. I, I think New, U.S. News and World Report has done great damage to many, many, many small liberal arts colleges, foisting upon them the notion that they should be national liberal arts colleges. I think there are maybe five or six schools that you could go anywhere in the country and somebody would recognize them. That doesn't mean they're better or, or good, mm -hmm. even. Chris, but can, uh, can but I, I, I think we serve this region. That's great. Let's make this region more interesting, more just, more loving, more compassionate, more economically sound. That, that's what I would be interested. That's what I was interested in doing. Chris, I yeah. guess what I meant to say sure. was I think mm -hmm. one of the great things about this place, at least when I came here, is it draws heavily from a blue collar yes, background, exactly. which I think is, is very special yep. about, mm -hmm. about it. What I meant to say is, yes, I think we're going to always draw mm -hmm. regionally, but to give our yes. students more of an international perspective. I couldn't uh, agree more. Yeah, exactly. Right. Dr. Collier, do you have any thoughts? Just an observation, I think, really to the point that uh, because of the experience I've had since I left Moravian, and particularly with the recruiting of um, presidents, deans, and so on, I was on 22 different, 25 different campuses for extended periods. Most of these were all small liberal arts colleges, and most of them were in relatively small communities, not all, but similar to the, the, the Lehigh Valley. And the, the imprint that they have as a society within that larger right. society is hugely important. And it has developed a, a kind of quality of citizenship there that has allowed for the emergence of leadership in a variety of ways from a whole host of people. Mm 
So I think the spin-off or the presence, maybe it is, of that institution is, goes well beyond just the classroom itself and right. has a mark in making a society uh, have a value that otherwise it would be absent if it was not there. Mm -hmm. All right, right. Mm -hmm. It happens here. Right. The fingerprint on Bethlehem is clearly right. a piece of it being highly Moravian. Thank you. Um, and, and, and last, uh, I'd like to know if uh, the three of you uh, would have any suggestions or recommendations to our new president, Dr. Brian Grigsby, <laughs> as he embarks on his journey as serving this college as president. Dr. Toffer, please. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I would say, number one, take care of yourself. Um, that sounds like a selfish thing, but uh, many, many people will want your time, your energy, your commitment, your affiliation, and um, you probably can't satisfy all of them. And um, so make sure you have time to breathe and think and um, be the kind of human being you have always longed to uh, become. And then I would uh, pick up on my two colleagues here, uh, listen, listen carefully, and uh, <laughs> care deeply. Thank you. Dr. Martin? I don't, I'm one of those people who believes that former presidents uh, should not give a whole lot of advice <laughs> <laughs> to the people that follow. Yes. Having said that, however, uh, in... It's a terrible question. Uh, in, yeah. in, 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 <laughs> no, in my experience, uh, um, I appreciated when I needed to understand something here, especially when I was new, I would call Herman up, mm -hmm. uh, the, the president of Randolph-Macon College. Um, uh, I would call him up also to understand that community. But I think generally, um, it, the best thing for us is not to, not to be uh, uh, giving too much advice to the people who follow us unless they ask for it. Okay, thank you. Dr. Cole? Maybe a small comment on, on that particular topic. I, I found that um, having around me capable, caring, and closely knit support person staff, support staff as well as fellow colleagues. And so I would say that um, if, if you can nurture that relationship in ways as to help allow everyone to feel the confidence of blossoming on their own, but in the theme of the effort that you're leading, of course, the teamwork that happens out of that is, um, is exciting and fulfilling to everyone. So I would care for those folks carefully. Brilliant. Now, we do have 10 minutes left. Um, odd, <laughs> oddly, the question I thought would take the longest time took the shortest time. So does anybody <laughs> have um, a question? We do have one more question, brilliant. Do we have any more microphones? Oh, thank you. Sorry, Scott. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. So my name is Melissa Labrie. I'm brand new to Moravian College, not an alum. Um, but I graduated from a small liberal arts school. So this had to go with the new liberal arts question. Um, what are your thoughts on non-traditional learners, so an online school, what Congress recently deemed as the contemporary learner. Do you see it as a threat, a missed opportunity? Because um, yes, I know we're a liberal arts school, but I also came from a university, small university, that really grasped onto it, and I've seen the benefits that it can do for a small school like Moravian College. Mm -hmm. Up to you. <laughs> I, think, I think Moravian has a great opportunity to be of service to non-traditional students. I think uh, Rusty mentioned before uh, uh, how, how an education is delivered is a very important question. One of the reasons I chose to retire, I don't, I don't have any idea about that question. I think one of Brian's strengths is that he does. So, uh, but who's out there who needs an education? I mentioned my grandfather, born in Frackville, worked on the Lehigh Valley Railroad from the time he was probably three years old. He, didn't ever, he never learned to read or write. And uh, he, he, he must have been an intelligent person. I mean, look at his grandson. <laughs> <laughs> so there must have been great promise there, but he did not fit into the traditional educational system of the 
1880s to the 1920s. And uh, my father went to eighth grade and, and was an immigrant to the United States and started working as soon as he was 14 years old <clears throat> until he died. Uh, he was a very bright person and could have benefited by some uh, non-traditional so-called education. Um, my mother used to get furious in the branch of the Lutheran Church in which I grew up. Uh, women were not allowed to vote or, or read or participate in any way other than to teach Sunday school. She was a remarkably gifted, strong, intelligent, humorous person, but... Uh, a non-traditional person for sure, given who her father was <clears throat> and her background, she would have benefited greatly by learning somehow how do, how, do we, how do we create access for such people in my own family uh, to have the opportunity through whatever means, traditional or non-traditional, that we, we suffer as a society because men and women of great ability are not receiving an education. Dr. Martin, any thoughts? Well, I mean, this is the question of the time. What, yeah. what, what is, how is this technology going to fit into um, uh, what, what more traditional uh, educational institutions like Moravian do? And um, I mean, one of the great things about American higher education is there are all kinds, all varieties. Yeah. And I would hope that, I would, again, I, I really believe that a residential Mm -hmm. uh, college mm -hmm. plays a very important uh, role in the lives of, of many right. young people. But um, <clears throat> I'm reminded that, that the vast majority of people who go to college do not go to a residential liberal arts college. They, uh, they go to uh, other kinds of institutions. Some of them um, uh, are, are just using this technology, not really uh, using real professors in classrooms. But I, th I think the, the question for us, for, from Moravian College, is how we're going to, I used the word before, appropriately yeah. appropriate yeah. this technology, but not lose what, what we really do well, and that is mm -hmm. have professors teaching in classes with real students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would simply say amen to that. That sounds like the right <laughs> You might, you might look into uh, Mount Holyoke College, where one of my daughters went, has a wonderful program. They're called the Francis Perkins Scholars, and it sort of combines uh, Rocky, uh, Rusty's insight. Um, women of all ages <coughs> come and live in residence. They are uh, fully supported by the college. There's, most of these women are single women with children, so there's daycare for their children, and they added immensely to uh, my daughter's education and to the general dynamic of the college. It's a very costly program, but it, it met, it addressed uh, Rusty's point of being in residence with faculty, but these weren't the traditional 18 to 22 year old women. They were 35, 45, 55 year old women uh, who were of, of promise, but had not had the opportunity to go to school. So that, that might be a model of some sort. Well, thank you so much. It's, it, it's coming down to the end of our night, and I want to thank the three of you for spending so much time with us, mm -hmm. um, for allowing me to get to know you all. Uh, it's been a real privilege uh, to be able to moderate this event. I've learned so much. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Grigsby uh, and Deb Evans for asking me to do this, um, and I want to thank Moravian College's community um, and our alumni base, our strong alumni base that comes back and fills this auditorium uh, to hear um, the challenges and the exciting future of Moravian College. So thank you so much. Uh, I couldn't be more excited about tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.